Oh, dang it. Hey guys, Mark Holty here. It is super awesome to have you guys joining me today. Um, I've been scrambling a little bit as I've been trying to get everything set up for another live Q&A. Big shout out to all of you guys that are posting um, comments here and I love to see where you're listening from as always. So today, once again, it's gonna be all about you guys. So I'm gonna take a lot of time to just answer your questions and to just try and demystify this crazy world of immigration we're dealing with. All right, let's see, we've got uh, Shaggy here it's from Iraq. Great to have you, my friend. Let's close this one up here and we'll get these moving forward here. Uh, let's see, we've got Rupesh from India. Um, and we better get rid of the timer here. Wow, it's one of those days. You guys will never know. Like you can see my camera. I've got a new camera here that I'm kind of experimenting with. And uh, it seems like it's producing a little better image, which is great. But I have a whole host of things that I have to try to do to, to get the lighting better, to get this to work better. Um, and so bear with me as I go through these logistical things. But right now, guys, I am just happy to be here with you. Had a wonderful day with the family. Those on the Facebook, Canadian Immigration Institute Facebook page, I posted a little video from Cameron Falls, which is just roaring right now at Waterton Lakes National Park. And um, yeah, so it has been quite an interesting experience. Um, and uh, we, we, because I went out there with the family, I was scrambling. I got my new camera equipment and everything is uh, trying to get things set up. But like it, like I said, the lighting isn't perfect, but ah, that's all right. We'll, well, you guys have never expected high, high, you know, professional quality production because the content is so good. All right, let's see where everybody else is is tuning in from here. So we've got Crudy is tuning in from uh, from India. Great to have you. Let's see who else we have here. Syed is UAE. Uh, there's my faithful compadre Igor. Big shout out to Igor. Sandeep, how, how are you doing? Um, <laughs> and Shimanta says, hello, hope you are a good advice. Well, I hope so too. <laughs> we've, got, uh, we've got Anu from Pakistan. Welcome, Anu. Great to have you joining. Um, and then my Tommy says, early stream. Yes, it is. And that's a good point. We are going early today because I have my meetings with um, immigration here. Uh, at one o'clock and so because of that I've had to be a little bit um, flexible and uh, yeah and in, in how we're structuring things because my call is supposed to go now at one and the whole reason I changed them from noon until now uh, to one o'clock from my noon traditional starting time was because of the call with immigration and so oh it was never a consistent time so that's kind of what we're dealing with so thanks for your patience yes it's an early stream and hopefully people will be able to see this um, okay we've got Samal from Kazakhstan excellent Ermi is Bangladesh excellent Chester's Kuwait we got a really good group Mariana, hello to you too. I like the little uh, the little icon you've got there. Omar, Peru. Omar, I think you heard my best friend Curtis. His his dear wife is he's separated from her. She's stuck in Peru, and and the travel restrictions are just not letting her travel. So it's been a really tough situation for him and his wife. So hopefully things are going well for you guys in Peru. Uh, let's see what else we've got here. We've got oh from Dubai. Okay, Erlitha is Dubai. And then we've got our Canadian contingents coming in. We've got Daniel's out in Vancouver. Welcome, Daniel. We've got Rock from New Brunswick. Rock, that is the coolest name. Uh, we've got Angie's over Algeria. You can see we're everywhere. We've got Calgary. Welcome, uh, Chidozi. Great to have you. And Marianne, the fantastic little flag there. Very cool. You guys really make this fun. You really do. And then our YouTubers, Crudy's in India. Um, we've got um, Ify is in Nigeria. Welcome, Ify. And uh, oh, and this is a common a common comment that I get. So Erlitha is indicating that uh, uh, Erlitha, er, uh, Erlitha has been trying to migrate to Canada for the past six years. I know it is really, really tough. Really tough. Ermi's Bangladesh. Um, oh, Kunal, awesome. Love the handle. Motorcycle tails, very cool. I have my new bike. My well, my new bike, my old bike that was stolen twice and I recovered twice. I've got some new tires on it, a new drivetrain, and it's just like riding a new bike again. I rode 
oh, it was about an hour one way over to my mother's house one night expecting my kids to be able to come and pick me up. And when I got there, <laughs> I realized that they had a party that they were going to in the evening. Just when I say a party, it was a couple close friends that they were going over to their home. And, uh, and so they couldn't get me. So I had to get back on my bike and oh my goodness, <laughs> let's just say this seat was a whole lot softer when I got on the bike to ride to uh, my mother's house than when it was when I came back. <laughs> okay, it looks like we've got a really gr gr great group of people that are tuning in here. Uh, we got Peter from Dubai. Um, Darshan is Mississauga. Good to see you again, um, Darshan. Let's see who else we have here. Um, oh, we've got... We've got the, the Boston contingent, the broke millennial. <laughs> That's awesome. Welcome, welcome. I hope you're staying safe. All of these crazy things that are happening and, and um, you know, it's hard to know what to say, you know, about all of the things that are happening in the U.S. And lots of people are talking about it. And um, it's hard to know what to say other than to just have compassion. And I feel like no matter what I say, it's not going to be the right thing other than just to say that, Racism is wrong in every form and facet. And uh, when it's systemic and when it's a part of the culture um, of, a, of a country, of a, you know, a region, a community, it's just, there's just no room in this world for it. So my heart goes out to all, you know, all the people, not just in the U.S., but all over the world who suffer from uh, racism in whatever form or fashion it comes. And so I just wanted to just say my two you know, my, give my two cents on it, but I just feel tremendous compassion for those who have suffered, whether it's been just recent or whether it's been generations of, of racism. So <clears throat> there's there's no place for that within the Canadian Immigration Institute, no place within the Express Entry Law Private Facebook group. And you guys will know in the early days of that group, we our moderators had to work hard to call out everybody who had political agendas, who were making uh, racist comments and and all those things just to keep that group safe so um yeah so just i felt compelled i needed to say a few things about that and i'm i'm just so grateful um i'm so grateful for canada we're not perfect by by no means there's there's huge issues we have with our first nations people and and the way they've been treated and and in in many respects it's it's very similar to what's happened in the u.s and i think to a large extent lots of countries have issues with this so it's something that there's no place for in our world today. And uh, I just wish, um, you know, everybody, in, in especially in the U.S., that they can just find a way to be safe. And uh, there's enough going on right now that, uh, you know, to see, you know, the, the clashes and things that are going on now, um, it's just, it's sad. So I hope things can be resolved quickly. All right, moving forward on a more pleasant note, we've got Somain, who's in Pakistan. Um, and uh, Marianne says, I hope we can meet someday. Absolutely. And I have had people, clients that have stopped by Lethbridge and I, that I've been able to connect with. So that would be wonderful. I'd love to do that. Puneet is in India. Welcome. Um, and we've also got uh, Bhushan also in India. And it's great to see YouTube and Facebook coming through. We've got um, uh, Grav, Namaste to you too from Nepal. And uh, Anu says, your email ID all you have to do is send an email to info at healthylaw.com and that's a good way to connect. Fai says, I love Canada. I do too. And uh, he says, I'm Kudesh. Hello, Kudesh. Good to see you. And Sandeep, same thing. Email ID info at healthylaw.com. You guys can also, and this is where I'm still working on my, my presentation a little bit here, but I'm going to shift my screen and see if I can show you. Uh, it's okay. It's all right. Right here on the web page. Remember, guys, if you're looking to connect with me, the best way is through that info at healthylaw.com, but also just click on the Start Here button and you can go right through and enter your information and, um, and we'll get back to you right away. We take this super, super seriously, uh, trying to be as responsive as we can to our clients. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Andy Trinidad representation. Rudy is from France. Um, <clears throat> Marianne, she's, she's getting her, her comments in there. A big, a big shout out to Mark and Igor. Thank you so much. Um, and then Ermi, same thing. I have a query. How can I eat? I mail you info at healthylaw.com or to that link that I've just showed you there on the Healthy Law website. Uh, Nessa's Vancouver. Um, 
Let's see, Muhammad says, hey, Mark from Boston, looking forward to our consult this afternoon. Yes, indeed, I am too, Faisal. Um, that is, uh, yeah, I'm really, really looking forward to that. So thanks for shouting out and thanks for tuning in now too. Very cool. Ronak says, hi, Alitz is Beirut. I don't think we've had one from uh, anyone from Beirut for some time, so welcome. I'll give you another shout out, Marianne, with the Philippine flag, you bet. Okay, and Omar says, which city is he? Dude, I am in the best city in all of Canada, which is Lethbridge, Alberta. And so it's about two hours south of Calgary in the wonderful province of Alberta. This is my home. This is where I chose to raise my kids. And because of that, it's not necessarily the immigration hotbed, but who cares where I live? Whether I'm in Islamabad, whether I'm in over in Nepal, whether I'm in Guatemala, or whether I'm right here in my home office in Lethbridge, Alberta, I come to you the same way, bringing the same service, no matter where I am physically located. So don't be just don't be deceived, Omar. <laughs> when it comes to location, it is irrelevant. Okay, yes, Tej, Nepal, Mount Everest country, fantastic. Okay, Syed says, can we share immigration issues like a ban? Syed, you can, and we'll get to that in just a second. I can't believe the the number of people that have been posting here, and I'm trying to give people a shout out. So I think we've got enough time now leading in where we can get to the questions. So big shout out to everybody who's posted. I'm not going to get to the bottom. Uh, there's just so many of you. Ronak uh, from India. Um, we've got someone from Pakistan. We've got another Pakistan representation here. And so, um, yeah, just big, big shout out. And of course, my good friend Ralph, who's such a faithful, faithful, faithful follower. He's here as well. And uh, Kerala's India. We've got Pakistan. There's just so many here. So as I scroll down here, those who've been posting questions, hold off for now and uh, and um, and then just give me one second once I get to the bottom of the feed here and then I'm going to start answering your live questions. Okay. Um, <laughs> Vishnu says, what model is your bike? It's actually a Kona Caldera and it's a hardtail bike. And I've had this bike for over 10 years now and it's been so good to me. And we've got good old Ray from BC. Shout out to you, my friend. I'm looking for some new places. Fez is from France. Au revoir. Au revoir. And let's see what else we have here. Uh, do, 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 do. We've got Brampton uh, um, representation. And of course, Ronox India. We've got Morocco. Wow, this is really cool. Okay, guys, I'm going to skip through. I apologize. Um, and uh, Karen says, Kona is available in India too. Yeah, it's an awesome, awesome bike. Okay, guys. <laughs> and look at this. Column says Canada Lethbridge. Absolutely. That's where I'm from. Okay, guys. Here is the thing. Um, I, those of you who are watching, uh, because people come jump on and then they drop off, um, what I want you to do is to understand that I will sometimes not know where this is going to go at the beginning. It depends entirely upon all of you guys. It depends on... Um, kind of the direction that the questions go. And so I really want to make this worthwhile. Uh, and sometimes people drop off before they have an opportunity to actually get their question answered. So today, because I am in a giving mood, I'm actually going to offer a free consultation when the time comes um, nearing the end of the uh, nearing the end of this live q and a, I'm going to have a special kind of question about three quarters of the way in. And then if you can answer that question correctly, your name will be put into a draw. And then from those answers, the correct answers, I will then draw it out and I will give someone a free consult. Okay. And that's about a $210 value for a 25 minute consultation. So those of you who are faithful and watching, you shall be rewarded. All right. As we go through here now, you can start posting your comments. Emeka, it's great to have you once again from Nigeria. Okay, so we will start with Syed here. So you guys can go ahead and start posting your, your comments now. So Syed says, I got banned from immigration for one and a half years ago for misrep. Is it possible to remove? Syed, the time to challenge those misrepresentations are when it happens. And it's through a judicial review mechanism, a leave to appeal to federal court. And essentially, there's a limited, a time limitation that you have to respond to. 
And if it's been over a year and a half, there's there's very little, if anything, that you can do to overcome that misrepresentation. And I don't know the circumstances, Syed, I, I feel for you. Sometimes the misrepresentation is so innocent. And I've had this battle with immigration lately. I really have. And I shouldn't say battle, but let's just say it's more of a, a philosophical difference. <laughs> because it seems so harsh to me that a person can be barred for five years for misrepresentation because they forgot maybe one visa refusal to the U.S. out of, say, three others. So let's say they indicated that they had three refusals and forgot the fourth one and didn't mention it in their express entry application or any application. And then an officer decides to bar a person. Can you blame, like, bar for five years? It just seems like it is such a cruel, cruel position to take. So I, I feel for you, Syed, but there's really nothing to do, that nothing that you can do about it. Um, the reality is right now, people have to be so careful. And um, it's one of the reasons why hiring an immigration lawyer is so beneficial because we're designed and taught to catch these things, even the innocent things, to make sure that you are not proceeding forward with something that is not 100% correct. And you attest to it when you sign off. You attest to, to the fact that you are, your information is true, complete, and correct. I'll give you an example. Just today, I had a very difficult conversation with one of my clients. And for a long time, she felt that she actually had been working in a skilled occupation in Canada. But in fact, um, she didn't quite have her registration and certification to work in that skilled occupation. And so she was working in a position, although performing a lot of the duties, that was a little bit lesser and actually a lower skill position. And she, um, in the beginning when we started the process, her reference letter seemed to indicate that she actually was performing all the duties of that, of that occupation that she needed to, to qualify under. But when we started to talk to the employer a little bit more, they actually saw her as a lower position. And so we couldn't proceed forward. Even though one of our old reference letters may have had enough duties, um, the employer didn't see her as being this higher level position. And if immigration was to call, uh, it would have only resulted in her receiving 11 months. And so we had a very uh, a skilled work experience. And so we had a very, very difficult conversation. And ultimately, now we're trying to explore some other pathways for her because Express Entry, even though she got her invitation to apply after going through the reference letters, it wasn't supportable. Now, some people might just think, hey, let's just kind of fudge it a bit. Immigration, how are they going to know? But as an immigration lawyer, and even whether I was a lawyer or not, the most important thing is my integrity. It's the only thing that I have. And if my integrity is gone and my my um, the reputation that I've built, it takes a lifetime to build that reputation. And it takes one incident for it to just poof, just go up in smoke. All right. So that was a long answer to a, to a, a good, good question. So my heart goes out for you, Syed. Okay. Uh, Manoj says, hello from Edmonton. Hello. And Emeka, big shout out to you again. Okay. Here's Kabir. Okay, hello, sir. Why is it that we can drive from the U.S. with a signed COPR and don't need a PRTD? I understand that if I fly into Canada, I would need a PRTD. Please explain. Well, it's because the, the requirement uh, when you're entering um, is and, and the requirement for a PRTD is really one for the airlines to help the airlines to know that they can board you and that you can come to Canada. Certain citizens from certain countries do need visas to enter. But when you have a confirmation of permanent residence, a signed one, um, you, you can just go to the border uh, from the U.S. and demonstrate it. But in order to get on the plane, if you're outside of Canada, <clears throat> you need a visa. And if you have a signed COPR, um, you, you need that actually actual visa to travel. Or if you're overseas, you need a permanent resident card. And your situation with a signed COPR, I'm assuming that you are a permanent resident, but maybe just don't have your permanent resident card. Well, that card is your authority to get on the plane. <clears throat> it doesn't mean <clears throat> that you're any less of a permanent resident. Once you've got your COPR, you are a permanent resident. And so remember, the PR card is just your authorization to get on an airline and fly, but it doesn't apply for land crossing. So you can go to the US and then drive into Canada with your signed COPR, and that's your evidence that you're a permanent resident. Full stop. All right. So that's how it works. That's why a permanent resident travel document is required. It's to board that plane. <laughs> Karen says, "Wow." Uh, Himanshu says, "Yay." I don't. This is the hard part when you've got these 
<laughs> when you got these comments that are a little bit delayed. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Rajbir says, good morning. Good morning to you. <laughs> Karen says, good man, Mark. Uh, Nadia's from uh, Rwanda. Welcome. Good to have you here. Anand is Toronto. Okay. Let's see what Crudy says. My express entry profile expires before receiving any nominations. Do I need to submit my EOI again to the provinces or do the already submitted EOIs work? So understand there are two different processes. So if you've been extended a notification of interest from a province and your profile expires, you always want to go back in and update that profile and renew it because if it's express entry based, well, you can't submit your express entry without a new profile. So you need to update that and refresh it. When you're just applying without express entry through one of the programs for the provinces, then it doesn't matter. Your profile doesn't doesn't impact on it. But you haven't indicated in detail which provinces you're talking about. But regardless, we always expressions of interest are often um, or notifications. But if you're submitting a sub, uh, submitting your expression of interest to the province after you receive a notification notification of interest, yes, you want to update it because those are through generally speaking through express entry. And you can't submit it if your profile is expired. Okay. Uh, Nessa says, nice, awesome. Okay. Let's get to uh, uh, Grajesh. He says, hi, Mark. My spouse work experience does not give us any additional CRS scores. Should we ignore it and mention as no for his work history? We don't have enough docs to show. Yeah. If your spouse does not have any work experience that's skilled, then there is no point in including that in the work history because then express entry is going to prompt you to submit a reference letter that serves no purpose so if you have no work experience to show i don't put any work experience in the work history section but remember in the personal history absolutely i make darn sure that i am listing everything in there in detail including all of the work history anything related to study periods of unemployment, all those kinds of things go in there. So important not to neglect that. Okay, good question. <clears throat> Fatima says, good evening. And uh, Fatima Xavier, I'm not sure exactly where you're from, but Fatima is kind of one of those good Portuguese-based names. Um, so I'll, I'll indicate Fatima. It could be Fatima. Some people go with Fatima. Great to have you. Okay, uh, Lotfi says, hey, Mark, all my documents are in French, but the stamps on them are in Arabic. Do I have to translate them? Lofty, there's lot feet. There's a number of people out there that would say, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. I get the stamps translated. I know it's absurd, but I don't take any chances. And you've seen online, you've heard of people that have gotten things refused. And I don't deal, as I've said repeatedly over and over, I don't deal in poss uh, probabilities, <laughs> likely or not. I deal in possibilities. And if there's a possibility an officer says, oh, I don't know what that stamp says in Arabic. Um, therefore, I'm going to refuse because your document wasn't translated. I don't take that chance. <clears throat> okay. Okay, this is from an uh, unknown in Facebook here. Let me just raise this up just a little bit. Okay, Mark, I'm post EAPR and my app is awaiting a final review. Could you please explain what's that? Secondly, my medicals were extended internally. Is that a good sign? Well, yeah, obviously, extensions and medicals, final review, um, that's just in kind of the final stages of the application. There's, um, there's, uh, you know, when, when it comes to reviewing applications, there's all kinds of different, well, let's say, let's say different kinds of reviews that they do. There's the first one when you submit your application, which is basically the completeness check. That's where they check to make sure everything is there. Then it's the process of assessing your qualifications. And so that review is basically checking to make sure that your reference letters have everything that's in them that they need, that your educational documents, that your ECAs are valid, that your your um, your IELTS and uh, your language tests are all valid. And then if they run into an issue and they have trouble verifying something, then they will send it for further review. And that additional or heightened review is where another officer takes a second look at it, the problem areas. And that's where it can often fall off the rails. And so um, the final review, uh, is basically that kind of a process. And then it shifts into the background, um, the, basically the security screening and the medical screening. So that's kind of how that process works. Okay. Um, okay, Litsa got another one in here. Are they currently accepting sponsorship applications? I intend to apply for inland spousal. So when arriving to the airport, can I have one-way ticket or is it having return better? Thanks. Let's say it all comes down to whether or not you can prove that you have temporary intent. 
that you're going to return home if you uh, if your temporary status expires. And uh, they the Canadian officers have the ability to assess something called dual intent, your intention to become a permanent resident at some future date, as well as your intention to abide by the temporary conditions on your stay. So for you, Litza, this is a loaded question and it really depends on the circumstances and it's not something that I can advise you on. In some, in some cases, it's totally fine to have a one-way ticket. In other cases, it may not be. And so I can't tell you one way or another which way to go with that, but your obligation is to satisfy the officer that your intention is truly temporary and you may have a long-term intention of being sponsored and that's totally fine. I do that with a lot of my clients, but everything is upfront, honest and forthright. All right. Okay, let's see here. Um, Mary's from Pakistan. Welcome, Mary. Okay, Raul asks a good question here. What is the future of the Federal Skilled Worker Program? Well, one thing we know is that so long as the travel restrictions are in place, it looks like they're not going to be issuing rounds of invitations. So we know we've got basically till the end of June, and then we'll see what happens. So we have a full month here. So there's probably going to be another draw or two for CEC. So those of you who are in Canada with low scores, CRS scores, you are benefiting heavily because of this. Those outside of Canada, we're in a wait and see mode. And personally, I feel that the, the totals are probably going to be in the high 470s when the first rounds of invitations are being issued for the Federal Skilled Worker Program. But it can only go so high because there's only so many candidates that have PhDs and are not losing a ton of points for age or that have masters and have three years of skilled work experience and English off the charts. That kind of is, the, is the, the highest that you can go on human capital alone. In other words, individuals who do not otherwise have um, some connection to Canada, like work or study, where they're getting those extra bonus points, or a sibling in Canada, for instance. Okay, um, uh, Tar um, Tarima says here, when are borders opening for immigrants? Well. Right now, we know the orders in council and the travel restrictions are pushing out to kind of the end of June here. So then we'll see what happens. It all depends. You know, it all depends on whether we're flattening this curve and, and if they're comfortable with putting in place um, the quarantining and the self-isolation of people coming into Canada. And that's really what it's all comes down to. But we don't have a direct, direct timeline on when the borders per se are going to be open. Now, remember, there are still... Uh, and you can go back to the last Tuesday's live Q&A that I did with Kyle Heinemann. And in that live Q&A, we talked in detail about the travel restrictions, the orders in council, um, how it applies for, for Canada. So essentially for, for Canada and the U.S., the base rule is you can travel. Um, but on top of that is it has to be for a non-optional or non-discretionary purpose, which makes it challenging and difficult. On the other side, the flip side, if you're outside of the U.S. looking to come to Canada, the general rule is no one can travel except a Canadian citizen or permanent resident. And then if you fit into another category, then you have to find yourself in one of those exemptions. And so go back, watch that video. Maybe Igor can post the link um, in Facebook, on the Facebook channel and on the YouTube. But go back and watch that because it gives you a really good idea where things are at. And Kyle did an awesome job with me. It was just a really, really fun, fun video to do. Okay, um, my Tommy here, <laughs> whatever your name is, do you need a birth certificate if you're filing for yourself? No, you don't, not for express entry. Only if you have a child, then in those circumstances, that dependent child needs to provide a birth certificate. Okay, uh, Puneet says, how can I apply for family PR? It's express entry if you're outside of Canada. That's pretty much the route, unless you have a spouse already that's in Canada. Okay, all right, and we will continue on here. Next one is, um, okay, Erletha says, can I move as an accountant to Alberta or Nova Scotia or as an admin assistant higher in demand? Erletha, this is a perfect example of something that would require that you, if I shift my screen over here, go to my site, start right here and book a consult. And that's the best way for us, Erletha, to go through everything and, uh, and just confirm for you what works and what doesn't. Okay? All right. So we'll flip this back now and I think we've got her going here. Good. Okay. Next one. Um, okay. Asan says, Ahasan, Ahasan, maybe, is it? 
Hello, Mark. Do I need to get an LMIA for job offer points? I work on a postgrad work permit for two years in BC after I graduated. I appreciate your response. Yes, uh, Ahasan, thank you. And this is probably a good teaching moment. Okay, let me see if I can find it. Let's see here. And you can probably hear my kids. I don't know if you can hear them in the background, but they are animated. They're having some fun out there on the other side of the door. So one day I'll bring them in and I'll introduce you to them all. But uh, they're having a lot of fun out there. <laughs> Okay, let's see if I can pull this up so I can show you. Um, I can show you. Uh, da, 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 da. There. Okay, I'm going to share my screen with you. Oh, it looks like I've got a little bit of an overlap here of too many things. I apologize. Okay, let me see if I can share my screen with you. See if I can get this right. Okay, so this is probably a good point. I haven't explained this for a while, but um, but. Uh, uh, Hassan, this is how it works. For an offer of employment, you actually need to, um, you have to be uh, in one of these three categories. So it goes without saying, federal skilled worker, Canadian experience class, it, it applies equally. So obviously the, the offer has to have these components in it from the employer. I won't get into details, but these are the three realities. One is you've got an LMIA, which I call a permanent LMIA. You're not in Canada, but the employer has gone out applied to show that there's no Canadian or permanent resident to fill the job they want to offer to you and they can then use that to support your permanent residence. It's not meant for you to come and work right now but it does give you those extra 50 points or 200 if you're in a double zero knock. Then the next thing here you can see is if you're already working in Canada on an LMIA based work permit and that's where you're already working you've got an LMIA it, it for the for the employer and, uh, and you're currently working in a, and remember, this is always a zero A or B skill level position. And then the final one is if you have a valid job offer that doesn't require an LMIA, but is usually under the International Mobility Program, and it's an employer specific. So you can see here working for an employer specific work permit. In your situation, you're on a postgrad work permit. So if we flip back here, I'm just gonna flip back to my other screen again, and just put a question up. You've indicated here that you are on a postgrad work permit. So you cannot, on an open work permit, get points for a job offer without your employer going and getting an LMIA for you. Okay, great question. That was good. I like that one. Okay, let's see what we've got next here. Um, okay, Mohammed says, I, and maybe this is a questionable answer today too in your consult, Mohammed. I've had an overlap with work and my education in Bangladesh, but my GCMS notes has me concerned as the case analyst quoted paragraph 7a. I could not post it all due to the 200 letter post limits. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not going to go through all of that. So Muhammad, this is a very, very specific situation. I need to look exactly at your GCMS notes. We'll take a look, see what the issue is, but understand you can have overlap. There's nothing, there's not a problem with work and education overlapping. The key is that you are um, are able to demonstrate that you actually performed all of the duties, that you worked at least 30 hours a week if that's full time. And if you're doing multiple things at the same time, full time school, full time work, I always provide a letter of explanation explaining how that's possible. And I know I watch my daughter here who's doing online classes. She's a theater performance major. And my goodness, the work that she has to do there, I wanted her to do a little bit of work for me in my office. But I can tell you that uh, the work that she has to do in the load is so heavy that it would be impossible for her to be able to work. And even if she could, she would never be able to work 30 hours. So that tends to be the issue that an officer will look at. They'll question whether or not you can do both full-time studies and full-time work. But some people can, and you need to make a case for it. Okay, all right, this one's shaggy. He says, my simple question, I work six months only in a company and two years elsewhere. Can that six months be counted into my experience as well? Yeah, understand guys, once you've meet the minimum entry criteria for either the Federal Skilled Worker Program or the Canadian Experience class, once you've met that, then when it shifts to express entry, you can add work experience as long as it's skilled, full-time, paid, you can add even work experience in different knocks. So it's possible to add it up, but you have to meet the minimum entry criteria for the Federal Skilled Worker Program or the Canadian Experience class. And for the Federal, I'll just give you a quick little overview of that one. For the federal program, this is where continuous actually plays a role. So you have to show that you've worked at least a minimum of one year continuous, full-time, paid work experience in the same knock. Once you've met that, 
if you're able to hit the 67 point threshold out of 100 for the federal skilled worker program, then voila, you, you can meet that threshold. And then you could technically even add another two years of work experience, which wouldn't really make sense. But in, you could two two other years of work experience in two different knocks as long as they're all skilled. All right. Great question. OK. All right. Uh, Bushan sitting at 481. OK, I'm, I'm a federal skilled worker candidate, CRS of 41. Should I be thinking of PNP given that the draws are paused currently or just stay put and wait for them? Any word or when would they resume? I always look at all options. I always do. I always want a backup and then I want a secondary backup and a tertiary backup. So I want to explore all the options that I can because nothing is guaranteed these days. But with 481, I would personally, I cannot see the CRS totals staying above 481 such that you wouldn't be drawn now yes everything is kind of held in abeyance you know there's not a lot of people that are um you know there's not a lot of travel which has resulted in this and basically a pausing of these federal draws but the time will come so you've obviously got a factor in age and things like that for you but if you have other alternatives and you can pursue those do it that's always my advice okay uh okay guru says hey mark whether self-employed work experience work in Canada with a T1 considered as CEC class. No, self-employed work experience is expressly prohibited. So let's shift over here. I'll pull you off of here, uh, Guru, and I'm going to shift my screen back to here. And this time what we're gonna pull up is CEC eligibility right there. And I'll show you something right on this page. And we'll pull up the link and it should give us a good view for you guys to see here. I could actually, yeah, well, I think that's probably, I can make this a little bit bigger too, but okay, there we go. Anyways, um, so if you scroll down here, you can see as we get to the work experience, once we're scrolling right here in this big bolded area, you can't miss it. Self-employment um, doesn't count towards the minimum requirements for the program. All right, simple as that. Okay, flipping back here. Next here, uh, we have... Uh, Nadia and she says does pro does the processing officer look through a refused visa so understand guys your obligation is to disclose disclose everything all past refusals that if that's one of the most common ways that they basically refuse applications for misrepresentation so please whatever you do remember remember that you must disclose them now I wouldn't worry overly about um, you know what they're gonna think or what how they're gonna treat it if it's a mere visa refusal then your job is to disclose it, but it will not negatively impact on your express entry application. You're just notifying them, you're being honest, and don't listen to anyone who tells you that you should kind of keep it a secret or try to hide it. Remember, the UK, the US, New Zealand, Australia, all have information sharing agreements to start with. So they know if you didn't disclose something, a prior refusal, um, like I said, that example in the beginning of having four US visa refusals, you disclose three and forgot one, well, cruel and heartless. You know, there's been situations where officers have actually then refused for misrepresentation because you missed one, which I think is a jerk move personally. All right, okay, moving on. Okay, this is a great question from uh, Nain. He says, due to COVID-19, would it be wise to apply for express entry now? And how hard is it initially to find a job there? Hey guys, I wanna tell you, you are not going to want to stop applying. It's open. If you meet the requirements, you apply. If you're a federal skilled worker and you're outside of Canada, put your profile in. Understand, guys, that this is going to pass. They are going to open it up. They're not going to just close the federal skilled worker program. And some of you in three years may be losing 15 points because of age. Who knows? Maybe, you, maybe in three years, you're losing 30 points depending upon how old you are. And how would it be if you went through the process or you chose not to go through the process because you didn't think that, you know, you'd be able to come right away and then the program changes and you you never are able to be eligible for any programs in the future. That would be devastating. So look at it this way. You go through the process. You If you get approved, you follow through. If you're not ready to move to Canada, you complete your landing and then you go home. You deal with what you need to do until the time comes when you're actually able to come to Canada full time. And remember, the obligation for a permanent resident is to show that you've had at least two years of full time work, uh, two years of, of physical presence in Canada out of every five years. 
So there's flexibility. But if you never go down the process, then you know, then you're going to lose out. There's no harm in proceeding. And in my mind, especially with how competitive it is internationally, if you're losing points because of age, you're going to lose out because you pretty much can't even be 30 years old with a master's degree, three-year skilled work experience, and a CLB-9. That's the bare minimum, right? And so let's say you turn 30. Well, bam, you're instantly into the 460s. And so the 470s is kind of like the the sweet spot right now, at least for the federal skilled worker program when they open it up. So finding a job, hey, like it's going to be difficult everywhere you go when you get started. But there are things that you can do. And if you're good at what you do and you, you learn how to connect and there's lots of resources, you use them that the government provides, opportunities are going to come for you. All right. Okay, let's take a look here now. Um, okay, Manoj says, I've applied for outline sp Outland sponsorship for my spouse and yet to get an AOR. Can I apply for a visitor visa um, and justify it as essential travel as I currently live alone and work? I can tell you, Manoj, it ain't going to fly. For the visitor visa, it's going to be really unlikely that they don't say, hey, um, you can't prove your temporary intent. We know you're not going to go home. This is speaking to your spouse. We know that you're not going to go home, uh, and so we're not going to approve this. So understand, this is this is one of the challenges that you're likely to face when you're applying for a visitor visa. Um, it's cruel and heartless, yes, but if you've got a spousal in the queue, it's really difficult to get that visa issued. Um, and then essentially, even if it was issued, uh, if she's not already here with you in Canada, that's specifically one of the areas that they consider as being non-essential or that's optional or discretionary and therefore the border officers won't let her in and in fact most airlines probably wouldn't let her board even if she did have the visa all right good question okay if that says we can't travel the copr will be invalid after june 17th is our pr application as a whole going to be cancelled or medical code m2 will be also reassessed okay the most important thing you need to realize is no your medical will not be cancelled and um, I'm not sure if I, if you've joined me before. Let's see if I can find this. Um, PD, PDI uh, residence. Okay, let's see if I can find. It's always tricky just searching because there's so many links out there and trying to find the right ones. Okay, so I think this is where we're going to go. I'm going to share my screen with you. And I'm going to remove this. Huh, looks like it. Uh, I guess I gotta close it. Okay, I'll just close there. There, it's out of the way. So here, this is the link. So novel coronavirus program delivery instructions. Okay, and then you go down here and you take a look at permanent residence. These are the instructions that the officers follow. And if you go through here, you'll see what happens if a person um, is unable to travel. Okay, and so you can see the instructions. Basically, your obligation, what they want you to do, is to notify them that you're unable to travel and then they will hold it okay and then you just keep them informed but you're not going to lose your permanent residence but you must submit a web form to IRCC and if we shift gears here IRCC web form that's probably going to be enough no matter where you're at to connect you might have to throw a Canada in there but this is how you notify them and lots of you have probably already been down this process but you submit this one here fill in the information and notify them just as they've indicated here that you are unable to travel because of circumstances outside of your control. Obviously the travel restrictions or even an inability to get a flight out of your country. So they are going to be kind. This is a situation where they're going to show compassion and I'm very grateful for, for IRCC that they are actually willing to do that in the circumstances. Okay, great question, Manoj. Okay, uh, and actually this was Ifat, sorry. Okay, let's see where we're at here. Okay, Shaquille, um, says I'm 45 years old and want to do 20 months EMBA from Calgary. Is will Alberta PNP be suitable for me after doing EMBA? Which stream will be suitable for me? Okay, you have to understand that um, Alberta is really heavily based on work permits. So if you go to school for two years, for instance, you can get a three-year open work permit under the postgrad work permit program. Then at that stage, if your work experience is tied to your education, that's an important part. You can go through um, the uh, the AINP Alberta Opportunity Stream AOS, and so that's traditionally what we do for my candidates that are older, like yourself, 45 years old. But you're going to need work experience, and it needs to be related to your education when you're in Alberta. Okay, good question. Um, okay, Gopi says CEC or all program CEC. <laughs> 
I think it's going to be a Canadian experience class, at least so long as the travel restrictions are in place. Okay, Yasmin says, hello, I can't do the digital photo now because all the studios are closed. So I can't submit my study permit application. Can I take it later with my biometrics or from my phone? I think you just go ahead and take it from your phone. You've seen the specifications. It's a digital photo. Do the best you can to replicate it. Clear background, clear image, you know, um, no sunglasses, all those kinds of things. Make sure that you don't have a glare. Um, so that's the direction that you go. That's what I would do. And just make sure that the image complies and you should be just fine, Yasmin. Okay, um, okay, Samin says, hey, I wanted to get a master's in order to prove my score, yes. But my question is, will my work experience, which is full time, would be considered? Understand, education and work experience are not related for the purposes of express entry. If you perform the duties, a substantial number of the main duties, in the skilled position, you were paid for at least 30 hours a week, all of those things that justify classifying your work experience as foreign work experience, <clears throat> that's what you can count. If you're coming to Canada, understand any work experience you've gained while studying doesn't count for the CEC, for the Canadian Experience class. So, but after you obtain your postgrad work permit, then that work experience can count towards your express entry. All right. Um, let's see here. We'll zip through this. Okay. Our boss says, Hey there, Mark. I'm post uh, EAPR and my app is awaiting a final review. What is that? Okay, so uh, medicals, okay, we, we've already addressed that one, our boss. Basically, final review means it's in the final stages of, of review, just like it just like it states. Okay. Um, okay, here's a good question. Um, I, do, I wish you would have posted your name because customized party deco <laughs> just doesn't feel as personable <laughs> as a real name. So I'm going to, I don't even know what your gender is. So I'm going to say, I'm going to call you um, Shel, uh, Sean. Yeah, there you go. So Sean, <laughs> that's a nice, uh, you know, universal name. So the reality is when it comes to your status in another country, you can actually go forward. Ask Igor, right? My Igor, my right, my right hand man. He, we went through a, a little bit of a challenging situation for him coming from the U.S., but he was without status. And so in his situation, it worked and we were able to demonstrate that he still met all of the requirements. He was not otherwise inadmissible. So is it possible? Yes, it is. But Sean or Customized Party Deco, um, you, I really recommend that you, you flip over and you consider booking a consult and we can discuss this in, in more depth because it's, not, it's just simply not as easy. So yeah, so that's what I'd recommend is that you actually book a consult so we can go through it in detail. It is not possible to do that right now. Okay, we are at 11.55 here and uh, we'll go for just a little bit longer and then we'll wrap things up. Okay, um, okay, pay stubs. Arnish says, hey, do I need to provide pay stubs? It says if they're available. So on, on the document checklist, so if you have them, I include them. And yeah, you've got your T4s and NOA, perfect, include it all. But there's no harm in, 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 um, in including your pay stubs if you have them available. Okay. Uh, okay. Yasmin says my study permit uh, is in danger if I had refusal for e visas several times, and it was due to my country being ineligible to apply for it, and I had no idea about it, so I kept applying. Okay, Yasmin, I know you've answered this, you've asked this question in the past, um, and the reality is every prior refusal can have an impact on future temporary applications, and so they use that and they factor it into whether or not they feel you will comply with the temporary conditions imposed on any temporary document they issue for Canada whether it's work, study, visit. So in your situation, you just have to do a very good job of explaining. And Yasmin, I'd encourage you to book a consult so we can go through this in detail because obviously this is a significant concern for you. Um, but you have to explain and justify how those refusals were really just not understanding um, you know, the, the actual requirements. And it wasn't anything to do with you. It was just you were prevented from, from applying because you didn't qualify. All right, and that's different than being refused on its merits. Uh, okay. Um, okay, Zanur, I'm not sure what your question is. It says, am I not going to have a ban if I applied for a provincial program but want to have a chance to get student visa? Um, it's not misrep. It's not, there's no ban if you're disclosing what you're doing. Um, so I don't see an issue with that. Um, Okay, uh, Karen, any FSWs, um, Copers issued uh, post 
March 18th, we have heard of people. Now, like I said before, sometimes immigration just confused that and thought the person was inside Canada and so sent that magical surprise, you're a permanent resident letter when in fact they're actually outside of Canada. Um, we have seen some COPRs being issued. Yes is the answer. Um, uh, okay, Aklak, uh, Aklake, Aklake. <laughs> I always have fun trying to pronounce names. Um, book a consult, my friend. I can't tell you, H45 isn't necessarily a barrier. When it comes to applying through express entry, if you have no connection with Canada, it most definitely is. And the only way you'd go is, is really to increase your CRS score through other means, study or work, which in and of themselves are a challenge. Okay, um, Anand says, I've received the West report in which my father's name is mentioned only under name on credential, but my name is mentioned in all other places of the letter. Can we brief this in LOE with affidavit? Yes, that's exactly what you do. Any issues that you see an officer might have, then provide an explanation. Now, whether or not you actually need an affidavit, I don't usually worry too much about that, as long as I'm just explaining the realities. Okay. Um, Angie said, I had an invitation from a province, but I'd done nothing because I'm waiting for the federal draw. Is my profile still in the pool, even with the invitation of the province, which will expire in a few weeks? If you can go in and you can see your profile and it's there, it's there. Simple as that. Okay. Um, Victor says, sponsored my wife's work permit. It was refused the first time and approved the second. Should I write an LOE for that? You just disclose it in the personal history. When you get to the statutory question section, you're just going to disclose that your wife had a prior um, work permit refusal. And um, and that's that's how you address it. If indeed you're talking about how to answer the background, you know, in statutory questions. OK. Um, Ermi says, hey, sir, my application has been in process for the last two and a half years, and I've been told that my application is in the second review uh, and it will take time. How how long could it be? Oh, my friend, that is something that I just don't have an answer for. You know, we have, um, yeah, we, we are in uncharted, uncharted territories. And at this stage, we really, really do not know where things are really at in terms of processing. So I couldn't even guess for you. Understand whatever the regular time is, it's definitely going to be longer. Okay, uh, Crudy says, my work profile here in India is uh, contractual and it's 11 month contract. Although I've got my points in the profile for full-time work, you think this can be a trouble later on for a visa. Well, if you only worked 11 months, but because of the way it rounds up by month. Um, so in other words, if you worked until September 1st and then you ended, the express entry CRS calculator would give you full points for that month. Um, they would give you full credit for it. And if you haven't worked the 12 months, then it's entirely possible that your EAPR at that stage, um, unless you've kind of recaptured it and an officer shows some forgiveness, the reality is you are more than likely going to be in a situation where you are going to have to um, decline that ITA, wait till you've got the full experience and then put it back in. All right. Okay. Let's see here. Okay. Robin says, I got an ITA in CEC and submitted application with an expired PR card of my sister as I am getting... <laughs> Uh, of my sister as I'm getting, um, uh, let's see here, 15 points. Uh, she applied already for renewal. And um, okay, so is this going to affect my PR? So understand whether or not your sister's PR card is expired or not does not change the fact that she's a permanent resident. But you need to address it. You need to specifically confirm she's applied to renew it. And, um, and if she has any, all the other evidence, right, she wants, you want to make sure, I would include a copy of her confirmation of permanent residence. Um, I would include a copy of the expired PR card and the fact that she's applied for a new one. And let's face it, it's taking a long time right now to get these. So an officer should be um, understanding. And I would indicate that when she obtains her new PR card, you'd be happy to forward it to IRCC. But that should not be a problem because remember that PR card does not confer PR status. And just because a card is expired doesn't mean that the person loses their permanent residence. Okay, Al says, my medical will expire in some weeks and my PR hasn't been yet approved. Will RCC ask for remedicals or will they extend its validity? As you've seen with the previous answer, in some cases they will agree to extend the validity. So just, it's on a case by case basis. 
Okay, uh, Grajes says, if I submit documents for the ONP nomination process, will my federal EE profile still be eligible and get picked up in the coming CEC draw? Yeah, if you're applying through one of the independent programs that are not associated with Express Entry, and you're going through um, the regular stream with Express Entry, you can totally do both. There's no restriction at all with that. Okay, Gagan says, I've got 442 under CEC. What are the chances? Dude, seriously? Okay, I don't know when you submitted your IT, your, your profile, but um, the chances are pretty high given the fact there was just a draw, right? And the last draw, if we show, this is kind of funny, Gagan. Actually, it is it has caused me to chuckle a little bit. Let's just go here to the rounds of invitations and let's just take a look at the most recent round of invitations. So we'll click on here and we will remove Gagan there and we'll go and we'll take a look. The most recent one, May the 28th. Look at the score, my friend, 440 CEC. So the chances are pretty good. And why you didn't get an ITA the last time, I don't know. <laughs> All right. Um, Mapala says, I've applied under um, a valid job offer. I'm in post ITA CEC category, four months completed. My question is, if I go to my home country now, it will affect on my application. Okay, so the valid job offer, you have to understand that if you're getting points for that valid job offer, then there's a lot of different factors. And I can't tell at this stage, you know, what your, you know, what the context is, um, because you can lose those job offer points if, um, if you're no longer working and for job offers, you need that employer needs to be able to, to confirm all of those details, including that they're going to continue to retain you one year after, uh, you become a permanent resident. That's some of the obligations. So there's not quite enough here, Mapala, to be able to, to answer, um, uh, clearly, but understand that if you're going home back to your home country, you haven't indicated here whether it's a visit or whatever, uh, but it could impact on your application because of the job offer portion. But understand that when you are going through the Canadian experience class, everything is locked in from respect to work permit, the eligibility for CEC, all of that's locked.